So the purpose of this talk is to talk about image formats and quality and specifically to talk about where uh, doing image manipulation might reduce the image quality. So the purpose of this talk is not so much to give you uh, all the solutions to the problems, so much as to make you aware of where the problems might be. So um, the first part of this talk, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, um, the, the physics of things like colour, uh, just to sort of lay the groundwork of, of what, the, uh, what is captured inside image formats, and, and then we'll talk about the image formats and the, and the pitfalls later on. One of the first things I wanted to talk about was pixel coordinates. Just choosing the right coordinate system or just knowing what coordinate system is being used within a image package is, is very important. If you have a look at this example, we have some fill operation on a rectangle and we've given some coordinates. And what those coordinates mean could be, could be vastly different depending on what library you're, you're using. Uh, in this case, we've, we're filling from 2,2 2, 2, to 5,4. If, we, if we're going from the coordinate 2,2 2 to 5,4, uh, one interpretation of this is that we'll uh, change a set of pixels which will be 3 pixels wide, which is 5 minus 2, and 2 pixels tall, which is 4 minus 2. So we could end up changing 6 pixels, uh, but an, a different interpretation... Um, so so this, this interpretation, we might consider the... Uh, coordinates as lying between the pixels. So if each of these is a pixel, a, the coordinate system is actually uh, talking about the, the edges of the pixels in some sense. So we're actually changing from this point 2, 2 to this point 5, 4. And so we end up changing 6 pixels. Uh, a different interpretation might be that the, the coordinate system is lined up in the middle of the mm. pixels. And so the point 2,2 2 is actually in the middle of this pixel, and the point 5,4 uh, is in the middle of this pixel, with the end result that we end up changing 12 pixels, which is twice as many as there. there. So whether you include endpoints within, uh, within fill operations and, and how you think of where the coordinate system is aligned with the, the pixel grid, that can make a big difference uh, about which pixels you end up uh, changing. And, and of course, this can matter with uh, lining up imagery on top of other imagery. So, obviously, the, the, the rule is know what your library uh, or whatever the image uh, package they're using, know what it, it is talking about when it's talking about co coordinates. Here's some other cases that we have to be careful. So, OpenGL uh, is this, this coordinate system over here. OpenGL, when it's drawing onto a computer screen, basically it uses floating point coordinates and the point zero zero is actually in the middle of the screen and the screen is, or the viewpoint, view, viewport is um, defined to be from a negative one, negative one in the bottom left to positive one, positive one in the top right. So it's a floating point coordinate system which then gets scaled to whatever the actual dimensions of the screen are. So you have to be careful of how you represent the coordinates and the accuracy of your floating point and so on. Another point is that uh, in the OpenGL system, if you're doing three-dimensional graphics, the, whether you're using a right-handed or left-handed coordinate system can matter. In this case, I think we've got a right-handed coordinate system, so if you put your thumb at positive x and your index finger at positive y, then you get positive z coming out of the screen. But different systems use different can use different handedness of the three-dimensional coordinate system. I'm going to talk about colour and how colour is represented in the computer. So I'll just start with some basic physics and biology. In human eyes, colour is detected by cone cells. There's, there's two different sorts of cells in our eyes, in the, in the retina. There's rod cells, which are mainly for low light vision, and they're mainly for monochromatic. So they just detect the intensity of the light. And then there's cone cells, and there's, there's three different sorts of cone cells that detect colour. And we can refer to them as long, medium, and short. And the long colour response is more in the red end of the spectrum, 
and the medium cells are more towards the middle, towards the green, and then the short short wave uh, is detecting the, the the blue end of the spectrum. Different animals have different responses in their eyes, and some there are insects and fish and some um, animals like deer that can actually see into the ultraviolet end of the spectrum. Our eyes can't actually do that because our um, our lenses actually filter out uh, ultraviolet light. So there's there's only a certain range that we, we can see of visible light. As you can see, there's this kind of bell curve that each of these cells has in, in terms of how they respond to the colour of the light. And our eyes and our, and our brains put all these different colour responses together to make a single colour that we, that we see. So if you look at these, these lights above us, they look white. They might not actually be a, a flat spectrum of light across many wavelengths. The um, fluorescent lights, for example, they tend to have be spiky. And so you end up with certain spikes in of blue light and, and a bit of red light and so on, and and less light at other at some of these other wavelengths. So so you're getting different wavelengths of light going into your eye, which which excites the the uh, electrical activity in these cells, and all of those signals get put together, uh, and, you, and your brain says, ah, oh, that's this colour, or in this case, that's a that's a white colour. Some people, approximately up, up to 10% of men and up to 1% of women, are actually colourblind in some way. And red-green colour blindness is the most common form of colour blindness. This is an Ishihara colour test plate that is used to check for colour blindness. You've probably seen this sort of thing before. 21 is what a colour blind person would see here because these dark greens here are actually designed to be a very similar shade to the red colour. So if you had red-green colour blindness, some of these green colours at the edge here would be hard to distinguish from the red around there. And so you'd end up seeing a two here because they've designed the, the shades here to look very similar. Um, so you might end up seeing two and one, whereas these colours here might look might look red too. You might have heard this term uh, gamut, colour gamut. There's a, an organisation, the International Committee on Illumination, the CIE, um, that's the French term for, for their organisation. Back in 1931, they defined a thing called the, the CIE 1931 colour space, which defines how different wavelengths of light can be mapped onto colours. So they produce this two-dimensional diagram that, that shows how, how the wavelengths of light map to colours, and various other colour spaces are represented in terms of that these days. So... The most important one is probably this sRGB, which you might have heard of, and that's the one that a lot of um, a lot of monitors will default to using, and that simplifies this colour space down into a, a very simple geometric shape, usually a, a triangle, which approximates some part of this colour space. So this is the CIE colour space is sort of an ideal physical colour space, and then we've got these computer implementations which approximate that with some simpler maths, and you'll see that there's this lowercase x and lower down down the bottom here and a lowercase y on the side. And I'll, I can explain what those are. We have a um, this this color space here, and on the side you can see a there's a capital Y going up the side there. That capital Y refers to luminance, and luminance is a physical property. It's it's an objective measure of the amount of of light going through a physical area. A simple way of thinking this is with this subjective term brightness, which is how, how bright that appears to you. Um, but luminance aims to be an objective measure. Um, and that's what that capital Y is. So the CIE's 1931 colour space defines this thing XYZ, which is a way of classifying these, these colours. As you can see, the brighter you get, the more you get towards these yellows and, and cyan colours. And you you don't you don't see so much color, but the darker you go, you can see more colors. The color space is wider until it eventually becomes very dark down the bottom. So that's that's the vertical axis there. And capital Z refers to a, uh, a mix of blue and green, and X is a is another mix. And these are mathematically defined to define this this shape, this color space. And then you've got these other terms, lowercase X, Y, and Z which are defined in terms of, of those terms. So, yeah, the main one I want you to take away from here is why it refers to luminance, which is a, which is a physical property of how much light there is.
it's essentially a three-dimensional color space. We've got two dimensions that we can see on this graph here, and then there's a there's a, a luminance value which will make it brighter or darker. So you essentially need three values. The reason why that's dark of, of um, on the side there is actually just because it's talking about visible light and what we can and can't see. So that darkness there has nothing to do with luminance. Um, but as I say, actual illumination sources have got some sort of um, different, there'll be a whole mixture of different frequencies in there. And, and our eyes will synthesize that together to the same color. So it's actually possible to get two different lights that are putting out very different um, sp spectrum um, distributions. And, and then, yeah, they'll appear the same to our eyes. And so, yes, you can imagine a, a brighter red. It could be exactly the same wavelength, but we're getting more photons of that colour hitting our eyes, and that, that will appear brighter to us 